Great, so my name is Matt Newman. Uh, I'm a mathematician turned software developer, so I love software and I love proofs, and I got so frustrated working on a C++ code base where I couldn't write down the properties that I wanted to hold that uh, I quit my job. I write that multiple times. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, API design specifically. Um, it's a nice quote, but the, the sentence I want to focus on is, we should build APIs that steer and point developers in the right direction. Okay, so we want to not think of library API design as something that uh, we are gifting to the world, but rather we want to design APIs that allow this two-way communication between the library author and the library user. Um, I'll get into more what I mean about that as we go. Okay, so how can we make good APIs? <coughs> it's a big question. Let's focus it a little bit. Uh, specifically, how can we make APIs that are safe in the sense that they're, uh, just an incorrect use of the API should be a compile time error. I don't want any runtime errors. Uh, and they should also be ergonomic. Um, you could probably imagine making a very sophisticated API uh, that could catch compile time errors but was really difficult to use. And if it's too difficult to use, the user is just going to take your API and hit it with unsafe perform IO or something and remove all of the hard work that you did. Um, so, what's the goal of this talk? I'm going to talk about a specific pattern for API design that combines existentially quantified type level names for values, theorems as phantom types, and safe coercions in order to design these APIs that allow two-way communication. Okay, so first of all, let's look at some unsafe idioms in API design. I think we're all familiar with this one, right? Let's just focus on the head function. Um, okay, this is not safe. Uh, you could imagine a sufficiently smart compiler could stop you from doing this. Right? Um, There's a similar pattern in a lot of other languages too. Um, another unsafe idiom that's related but maybe even worse is what C++ does. Uh, here's the C++ version of that program. I make a vector uh, with no elements. See? And, and that's what its head is. Okay. Uh, at least this time when I ran it. If I did it again, I might get a seg fault, right? It's, it's, it, it's sort of even worse than, than blowing up the runtime is maybe continuing to go anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, how about some safe idioms? All right, so uh, probably the two common safe idioms could be classified into restricting the domain or expanding the range. Uh, so restricting the domain, that's like introducing a refinement type, okay? Um, head is not safe for all possible lists, but it is safe for all possible non-empty lists. So we could introduce a, a new type, non-empty list, which manifestly has the head and the rest of the list inside of it. And then the head function is safe. So if you think of a, a real life function like 1 over x, we're basically just tearing the x part out of the domain. So this is, this is pretty useful, except that the library out there has to predict uh, what kind of restrictions of the domain they're going to need ahead of time. And then there's a, a big question of, like, are we going to re-implement re length for non-empty lists? Are we going to re-implement, you know, all, everything in data list, everything in base? Uh, it's sort of a pain. Right? And then the user has to remember a whole different set of functions to use for non-empty lists compared to what they're using for lists. So then kind of the dual safe idiom is to use option types to expand the range. Okay? So here uh, we take the, the thing that formerly was an error case, and we return nothing. And if we can correctly process the input, we return just the input. So going back to that 1 over x thing, that's like expanding the range with uh, an extra value. And then whenever we would have screwed up, we just send that to that extra value instead. So I think um, this is often trotted out as kind of everybody's first example of uh, making a safe API. And I'm not uh, discounting the benefits of this, but I claim that we can do better in some cases. Um, so another idiom is, is if you have dependent types, maybe you can just say what you mean. Right? Like, here's some Agda signatures. For head, uh, I have a list of A's that has um, one element and some more, and so I can give you an A back. And that's a total function. You don't have to worry about it. But actually, this, this sort of suffers from the same problem that the non-empty list type did. Right? We have to predict ahead of time what the user is going to try to do with our API so that we can give them some types 
that have the information that they need to make their safety argument. And so really, there's still the question of like what properties should be reflected in the types. OK, so with all that in the back of our heads, let's look at a, a particular case study in API design. So I want to look at these two functions um, for manipulating lists. The first one, sort by, it takes a operator and a list, and it gives you back the list sorted by that operator. Uh, and the next one, merge by, also takes a operator and two lists that are sorted by that same operator, And then it can just, it can lock the two lists in parallel, comparing and merging as it goes, right? So you get uh, a merge of two already ordered lists in O and plus M time. So it's nice and fast, uh, and it's as awful as the C++ head function, because if the user messes up, if the user forgot to sort their lists, or if they sort them by the wrong operator, uh, this will run. It'll just give you nonsense back. Right? So it's problematic. Um, and a, kind of the best thing that we can do, or at least the most common thing that we do, is we just stick a comment on the function uh, with big bold letters that show up in the hat to say, you know, don't screw this up. Uh, make sure that x and y were sorted already by the same operator that you gave me here. And if you don't do it, it's your problem. Um, so we might think, as a library author, God, that's kind of that's kind of awful. We should be able to help the user a little bit more. Let's make this safe by uh, checking that the property we needed held. Right? Let's check that the lists are sorted as we go, and then we'll return a maybe list of A's at the end. Okay? So we'll give them back just the merged lists if the user correctly gave us things that were sorted. And we'll give them back nothing if they gave us something that was incorrect. Um, so this is our fancy safe merge module. Uh, all we're really doing is adding a, a maybe to the end here. And then we're adding a test at the beginning to see if the two lists were sorted in the, the correct way. Um, and then returning just the unsafe merge by a list or, or nothing if the user gave us something badly formatted. So what's the problem with this function? It's not, it's not buggy, but conceptually, what's the problem with it? Yeah, right. We're, we're doing all this extra work, right? Uh, we're, we're walking through each of the input lists just to check that they're sorted correctly. Uh, and then the normal, the normal case, the user will have sorted the list correctly, right? So this is just extra work that we're doing uh, for no real reason except to make this safer. Um, Plus, so, the call that cool has to deal with that maybe. Yeah, that's right. So. That's, that's three sides from now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this is, this is what I imagine uh, the, the author of this API uh, thinks of themselves. <laughs> it's the author. At least the poor benighted users of the API. And we have to make sure that they stay on the straight and narrow by uh, giving them nothing if they try to use our API incorrectly. All right, so how do the users feel about it? Not like that. Uh, maybe a little bit more like, like this. <laughs> uh, so the users of the API are not going to be happy, because what's an honest user going to do? Uh, here they are trying to implement um, a merge function. They get their operator. Um, they sort the two lists. And then they merge the two lists. But they did everything right, right? They shouldn't have to check if the result is nothing. <laughs> They know they did everything right. So they're just going to throw it from just in front of it and call it a day. Um, except six months from now, some other user is going to edit this code. And suddenly that from just will lead to an exception at runtime. time. Um, so the, the problem here is, is that the library author is forcing the user to handle the nothing case, even if the user did everything correct, even if the user is abiding by the contract of this API. Okay, so why is the user frustrated? The library API demanded that a precondition would be met. The library enforced that precondition by returning a maybe type. But the user did ensure that that precondition held. So why are we making them check the nothing case again? They shouldn't have to. It's, it's not surprising that they reach for from just. And this happens in reality. So uh, if you don't, I highly suggest you just keep a copy of package on your laptop. It's not that big. Um, and 
then you can have a lot of fun grabbing around for different things. Uh, a really rough grab of Hackage found at least 2,000 cases where map.lookup was immediately followed by from just. <laughs> so, so why? What are those 2,000 cases? If they're immediately following lookup by from just, the user probably has some reason to believe that that key is present in that map. Right? Um, but they didn't have any way of communicating that to the library. They didn't have any way of telling the uh, data map API, look, here's my proof that this key is there. Right? Give me back the value without a maybe around it. Can we do better? Uh, I guess normally when you when you ask a question on the title page, the answer is no. But in this case, I think we can. Um, you might think otherwise. Uh, so what we're really after here is a two-way communication between the user and the library. Okay? The library author is trying to say, hey, this function can only be used if condition X holds, and the library user wants to be able to say, okay, I've ensured that X held. You know, here's a certificate of Xness. Now let me use the function. There's a little bit of a technical problem here, and this is, I think, why people usually read for dependent types for this sort of thing. Uh, the, the problem is that the, the only thing that the library author really has for expressing constraints on their API is, is the type signature of the functions in the API. But these constraints probably have to do with the values being passed to those functions. Right? So in order to express the constraints, you need to be able to reflect the values into the type system somehow in order to put them on the types of the functions. So if you have dependent types, you can just put values in the types and it's no big deal. But in a non-dependently typed language, you don't have that option. So let's see what we can do instead. So here's the key idea number one. Um, and if you want to take exactly one idea from this talk, this is probably the most interesting one. Um, so the idea is that you can use phantom types and new type wrappers to put phantom names on values. And those names live at the type level. So here I've got a little, um, I'm using a lot of type operators in this talk. Uh, I've got a new type uh, of A where I've attached a type level name to it. And this is a phantom type parameter, right? It doesn't appear on the right hand side at all. Um, and this is a new type wrapper. So the runtime representation of this thing is just a, an A. There's nothing uh, at runtime that makes this different than an A. So this name only lives at compile time. Um, I'm going to make use of this function quite a bit that just forgets the name on a value. And we're going to implement it with a safe portion, thank you very much, <laughs> um, to ensure that this has no runtime cost. Okay. Uh, OK, so that's names and forgetting names, but how do we introduce a name? So the, the key idea here is that we can introduce names, uh, but only using this name combinator that does an existential quantification on the name. So morally, the type of this function is this. Uh, if I have an A, then there exists some name such that A has that name. Now we can't encode that directly, so we have to use this kind of, uh, this trick where we use a rank 2 type, and instead of giving you back an uh, uh, existentially quantified type, we say, well, what did you want to do with that existentially quantified type? I'll do it for you. Okay. Um, so is that, is that relatively clear? Okay. So. The important thing here is that by existentially quantifying the name, we ensure that the user can't just introduce names willy-nilly. Right? Uh, they can only go through this combinator. And then just like the, um, the phantom type variable for the ST monad, um, they can't smuggle the name out of that computation. They can't really inspect the name. Right? They don't know what name they get. Uh, they just know that there is a name. But once you have a name, you can start talking about it. So the second idea is to use uh, predicates that again are new type wrappers, so there's no, no cost at runtime, uh, with phantom type parameters. But those phantom type parameters can refer to these names. Right? So suddenly we have predicates that can refer to values. Um, so here's one for the library that we discussed. Uh, a sorted by com A is an A that's been sorted by the comparator that has the name com. So and again, we can, we can strip that off for free. Uh, and then this is what the sort function would look like. Okay, so it takes a, a comparator with a type level name comp okay, and a list of A's, and it gives you back that same list of A's, but it's been tagged with this, this new type wrapper that's so been sorted by the comparator with name comp. And these aren't like type, these aren't symbols or anything, there's no, nothing funny about kinds, it's, it's just it's just a type variable. Um, okay, and, and this is again free. That is a coercion. We're 
dispatch into the original sort by function, of course, which courses it again. Uh, so at runtime, this really looks just like a call to sort by. All right, so now how do we communicate that funny precondition that we had? So here's a version of merge. This is, okay, give me a comp breaker named comp. Give me two lists that have been sorted by comp, and I'll give you back another list that's been sorted by comp. Um, but actually something kind of magical has happened. Right? We, we can't compare functions for equality, but this type signature ensures that these two have been sorted by the same function. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of voodoo going on with this combination of ingredients. Uh, and what's the implementation look like? Well, it's easy. We just uh, strip off all those new type wrappers around the arguments, send it to the unsafe function, and then coerce the result to add our tag back on. So how would the user actually use this? Well, here's their unsafe function. Uh, now, Abracadabra, here's their safe function. It, it's almost the exact same, except uh, we don't have that from just anymore. And instead of let binding a name for the comparator, they just use the name combinator to introduce the name. Then they sort by that comparator. Uh, and then they send the same one converged by. And the compiler is perfectly happy. But if the user screws up, if they forget to sort something, or if they sort by the wrong comparator here, then it'll be a compile time error. So we've managed to give a totally safe API for this funny condition on sort by and merge by that uh, at first approximation it seems like it's not really amenable to um, safety. And the key idea number three with all these coercions and everything else flying around is that all of this machinery should disappear on compilation. So if you, if you look at this function that the user wrote, and you look at the core that gets generated, um, focus, focus on this part, uh, you get a call to the unsafe merge by, using the, the comparator, and the lists are sorted by the unsafe sort by. Right? So at compile time, the, compile, the, the code that's generated by the compiler is exactly the same as if the user just used unsafe functions all over the place. Right? But we're guaranteed that it's safe because of this type level hacking that we did. I need a drink of water, and are there any Questions about this? Okay. All right. So, how far can we take it? <laughs> uh, we can take this idea pretty far. I, I do want to say um, the the ideas for designing a safe API that I showed you up to this point you can pick up and, and use anywhere. You can make safe wrappers around existing libraries. Uh, they're pretty lightweight. Um, but it is an interesting question to see how far you can push a concept. Right? So let's see how far we can push this concept of, of APIs where we can prove things about them. Um, there were a couple of, of lingering questions. Uh, we still have that problem of deciding which, which types are worthy of getting new type wrappers. Um, it's still not quite clear how to handle properties that involve constraints on multiple values. Right? Like which, which value would you put the new type wrapper on? Um, and then, how do we know that we've given the user enough information to complete their safety arguments? In the case of sort by and merge by, there's really only one argument that the user would ever make, sort of. Um, all right, so with that in, in mind, uh, here's idea number four, if you want to take it to the limit. Um, can you introduce ghostly proofs? Okay. So before, we were sticking a name into the phantom type parameter of sorted by, but we can put anything there. We could put uh, some huge complicated type that represented a complete proof of the safety argument that we wanted. And because it's a phantom type parameter, it's going to go away at compile time anyway. So that proof won't have any runtime consequence. Uh, so here's a little module for making ghostly proofs. Um, we're going to define a proof type, uh, and we're not going to export the constructor. But we're sort of going to export the constructor, because we're going to give library authors this function that lets them just assert properties are true. Um, and then we're going to have a new type that lets us take a value of type A and stick a, a proof onto it. So uh, if I have a proof of P and I have a value of type A, then I can get an A with P in its context. And if I have an A with P in its context, I can get a proof of P out of it. 
Um, P doesn't have to do, have anything to do with A. I can stick a proof about anything onto any other value. It's just a way of carrying proofs around with no runtime cost, because they're sitting in the same type parameter of some other value. Uh, I can even pass these implicitly if I want. Um, I can make an empty type class, uh, and I can make these note and recall combinators that take a proof, and then stick it into the implicit context. Um, or vice versa, I can take out a proof that's sitting around in my context, and I can pull it out into an actual proof. Right? So I don't even have to pass these explicitly attached to a value. I can actually pass them around using the constraint mechanism. Um, it sometimes gets a little unwieldy to practice, but OK. So along with that, I'm going to need to provide a bunch of proof combinators so that the user can make safety arguments. So I'm going to define a bunch of data types, like or and 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 equals. And I don't need to put anything on the other side, because they're all sitting in phantom type variables anyway. Um, and then I can write down all of the rules of propositional logic. If I have a proof of P, then I have a proof of P or Q. Um, if I can dispatch a proof of P and a proof of Q, then I can dispatch a proof of P or Q. And on and on and on and on and on. Um, if there, this is actually in a, in a um, library called GDP on package, and I think this file that has all these proof combinators is a couple thousand lines long. Um, Okay, so let's see how we actually design an API using this, this full GDP machinery. Uh, I'm going to make a little API for working with head and tail safely. So the first thing I'm going to do is just define some predicates. Is the list nil? Is it a cons? Uh, and then I'm going to make use of these pattern synonyms to um, essentially get, be able to pattern match uh, such that if I, if I have a list and I pattern match to see if it's nil, and it is nil, then I'm going to get the fact that it's nil in my context within the body of that match. Okay? And same for cons. Uh, so then I can write down my safe API functions. Here's head, perfectly safe. Uh, if the fact that x is in cons is in my context, then I can take its head, the end. Um, same with tail. If the fact that tail is a cons is in my context, then I can take the tail. And we're scoring down to the, the three loop functions. Now let's see how the user would actually use this thing. Oh, sorry, um, one more. Uh, the library author probably is going to have all these different functions, like the list, reverse, say. And they want to be able to express properties of those functions. Like for reverse, I maybe want to express a property like, if I reverse a list twice, then I get back the same list. Or maybe I want to express that if my list was a cons and I reverse it, then it's still a cons. So the library author can just write down all these axioms that they believe to be true about their library, uh, and maybe use you know, more sophisticated tools to check that those really hold. They can explore all these proof combinators, and then the user can construct their safety argument by combining these things. So there's a little bit of funny business about how the library author gets to introduce a new name here. Um, you can get into that in the paper, but it relies pretty heavily on the magic coercible machinery in GHC. Okay, so how could library user make use of this? So here's a, a safe um, function, almost. Okay, so we get the arguments, um, we inspect them after naming them. If they were nil, we say, hey, there wasn't any arguments. And if it was a cons, then we print the head, and we print the head of the reverse of this list of arguments. Um, so GHC is going to complain if I try to compile this program. Does anyone see why? Yeah, exactly. So GHC is going to say, I couldn't deduce the fact that uh, reverse is a cons from the context, which is that name is a cons. Um, it's too bad it didn't call it access, but whatever. Okay. So we have to actually say, to tell GHC why we think it's true, why we think that this implication of head is safe. Okay. And so we do that by just manipulating what's in the context. Uh, so here's the same program, except we use this combinator here to apply this lemma that was exported that said that the reverse of something, the reverse of a cons is a cons again. We already know that x's is a cons, so then this adds reverse x's is a cons into our context. And now GHC is perfectly happy. It's like, okay, this is safe. And you told me why it's safe. 
So I'm going to allow it to compile. And uh, the end. Okay, so what's the takeaway here? If you want to make an API design using this ghost and departed proofs concept, the first thing is you need existentially quantified names so that you can discuss values at the type level. You want to avoid Boolean blindness by returning proofs to the user. You want to avoid runtime overhead by making sure that all those proofs live in phantom types. Uh, and then finally, you need to give the user a rich set of combinators and lemmas so that they can construct their safety arguments. Okay. So um, this is a library that implements most of the concepts in our package. Uh, there's also a repo that goes with this paper that has some more experiments. And then, um, so I don't know who this person is in reality, but on GitHub, there's SAI. Uh, in the paper, there's an example of expanding the SPMonads interface so that you can actually share mutable variables between different regions in a safe way. Uh, and they did a full implementation of that, that concept. So, thank you.
So keys is actually, uh, you should think of it as the name of, uh, the type level name that we're using to talk about the key set of this method. My question, so when you add these tags from the names, you change the type of the thing. Do you find yourself that you have to write a lot of the and words and so on when you actually want to work with the um, As a library author, yes. As a user, not so much. There's sort of a, there's a boundary where you introduce some names because you're about to talk about them and formulate some argument. Um, and then maybe at the end you hit it with a the to get back to the world of normal Haskell types. As a library author, yes, there's a lot of the's as you move things from the, the safe boundary to the unsafe part. Uh, I'm wondering how much you know it improves. Um, is, it, is it hard to make it to um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a nice question. So, um, when I first made a draft of this paper, uh, I showed it to Esco de and he said, uh, well, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in Cock, and um, writing proofs is terrible, basically. <laughs> uh, and, you, you know, all your time spent with finicky details. He said, it's really worthless without tactics. Um, and I just happened to read an article about type checker plugins. And it turns out that you can implement uh, tactics using a type checker plugin. So, in, um, at least in the GPT demo repository, there's uh, a type checker plugin that you can use to do proof by analytic Tableau. So, for kind of basic propositional logic stuff, you don't have to write the proof at all. You just say Tableau, and if the thing you're asserting is true, then it'll it'll check that and let it go through. And if the thing you're asserting is false, you get an error. Um, so. The type checker plugins actually give a really nice mechanism for, for building in uh, custom proof tactics. Do you eventually hook up to the Excel solver, right? Yeah, definitely. 